This is Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Douglas Brinkley. Episode 13 starts after this. Do you keep diaries when you meet with presidents? Um, I take some notes afterwards, Brian. If, you know, I, at that time, I don't want talking to them when I go home. Yes, uh, I would say I journal down what I, you know, key points, key phrases that I picked up in that particular encounter. Now, sometimes I'm tape recording a president, and that's a whole different thing than I have a transcript of it, uh, and, and some of them for hours and hours. So it's, uh, it's always incredible to talk to a president. You realize there's so few of them in American history, and it's a, a privilege to get to ask them questions you want to ask. All, other, I have letters from a number of presidents who I would write and ask questions for a book I'm working on, and they would write me back. Uh, I have framed a number of letters from George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, who would actually take the time to, you know, give it, write me a long letters about different issues. I have a correspondence from Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter. Let's go back to the list of recent presidents that you might have had some interaction with. Yeah. The current president, have you ever spent any time around him? Oh, I know Joe Biden pretty well. I once wrote a long profile of Joe Biden for Rolling Stone uh, when he was vice president. Um, he took me around. I also had a private dinner with him at the at the uh, vice president's home um, and got to talk to him quite a bit and, and um, once spent time with him up in Boston in a very real way. So, yes, I mean, anybody could pull up my profile of Biden uh, for Rolling Stone. So I feel I know him well. What did you see up close? Uh, well, he had such a storied political career, and everybody kind of knew, knows Joe Biden. Uh, it would be impossible to interact with Washington, D.C. and not have had an encounter with him. Um, you know, I think he's a little bit, uh, There's a, as he's gotten older, he's, uh, and seems to feel pain after the loss of Bo, um, there's, there's no question there's a little Eisenhower in him in the sense that it's impossible not to like him. And then there's a little Ronald Reagan, and as he's aging in his forgetfulness, but at heart, he's a liberal. He's of that generation of uh, Ted Kennedy and Walter Mondale, and, and you know, he he's emerges out of that. He was very close to Ted Kennedy. But he's marketed himself as a more of a working man's centrist. Uh, when I see him as a little more of a, a New Deal liberal, um, and he's a he has staying power. One would have thought Joe Biden would have been long forgotten in the annals of Washington, but he hung in there. And uh, obviously, being a president of the United States at this crucial time is, is it means he's a chance to become a very important president. Did you get any sense of what his relationship was with Barack Obama? Because often the media suggests that they didn't get along and, they, and that Barack Obama didn't like him. I don't think it was a matter of like. I used to see Barack Obama, and there was always a feeling like, oh, my, I, I think early Obama, first term, uh, when Biden was be, making a lot of gaffes uh, and Barack Obama wasn't, uh, I think the lack of discipline uh, that Biden exhibited um, annoyed uh, Obama. Um, it w wasn't a matter of disliking Joe as a person. It was just like he put his foot in his mouth again, stepping on message. Um, and after a while, uh, quite remarkably, Biden started turning his gaffes into um, a, something endearing. And then he started wearing sunglasses, uh, aviator glasses. And then I think he, he did well in some of the comedy skits with Barack Obama as, you know, cool Joe in his hot rod car. And, uh, and they started creating really a dog and pony show. T they, they started w working uh, with some synchronicity and, and uh, you know, uh, almost a, they, they needed each other. Uh, but their personalities are very different. Barack Obama does not like error, and he particularly, it will be hard on himself if he says something verbally explosive. You, When he talks, you can see him writing the words in his mouth in a deliberate fashion. Where Biden is if allowed to freelance off a of teleprompter is apt to go in any direction. Uh, and so there are very different political styles. Could you see the aging process 
and Barack, uh, Joe Biden? Oh, there's no question. I mean, this is not the same Joe Biden of, you know, 2008. Um, it's just a naturally he's gotten older. But I think the loss of of Bo took a heavy toll on him. Um, I was surprised, not that he got the Democratic nomination. I always thought Biden was going to pull it off, uh, even at the at the very end. Um, but I was surprised at his campaign work that he was going to stay in Delaware and use COVID as a, a reason not to go and do a lot of things. I thought that he may have been, you know, being portrayed as operating as the basement Joe Biden. Um, but it worked for him because there was enough fear across the land about COVID. He seemed to be acting responsibly. And he he didn't annoy people. Trump and Cuomo got a lot of media attention once we were in the pandemic. But both perhaps were, were talking too much. And when you talk that much, you give rope to hang yourself. And they put a lot of error on the public record where Biden playing it low key, a little bit subterranean um, for, you know, even through the summer months of um, 2020, it actually helped him. It was somebody, the campaign actually worked in his favor. And I, it surprised me a little bit. You see the staff up close. Some of the staff that you must have known then are still with him now. How did they treat you as a historian slash writer? Um, Oh, everybody, you know, at this point in my career, Brian, I I've, I've know people, Democratic Party, Republican Party, they're with historians, it's different than journalists. Uh, they're, uh, any president or vice president always wants to, you wouldn't want to fight to be that if you didn't want to get a great reputation in history. So you usually get uh, wined and dined a little bit or treated very kindly by a sitting president, whatever party they are, once they, if they know who you are as a historian, why would you want to tick off a particular historian? Um, so, you know, it's a little different than I'm writing copy the next day for the Washington Post or the New York Times, and I'm looking for a phrase that's going to create front page news the next day. The truth be told, it's much more effective um, when they're ex-presidents as a historian, because at that point, you know, Jimmy Carter will go back to Plains, Georgia, or Bill Clinton in Chappaqua, or George W. Bush in Dallas, and they're a little more relaxed to talk to a historian about the historical record, because they're not as busy, and they can have a just enough perspective to start seeing where they might fit in the history game. I have noticed that any president who thinks their presidency's over when they leave is mistaken. It becomes a sweepstakes game for legacy. And the Kennedy people, John F. Kennedy's allies, did a marvelous job of, of selling the Kennedy legacy to history. And on the right, the Reagan people did a marvelous job. So. You look at public opinion polls, you'll see Kennedy and Reagan, very popular presidents with the public at large, and that takes work. It wasn't by osmosis. It wasn't even by who was the best president. It's just they were able to um, project. And their two most visited presidential libraries pre-COVID uh, were the Reagan Library and the Kennedy Library. People are invested in those two um, leaders. What do you think of presidents being the age of Joe Biden? It would be better in a perfect democracy that we had leadership in their 40s and 50s showing a new generation carrying the torch. Um, but things, the, the wheels came off the track recently. Uh, the fact that we had two septuagenarians and Donald Trump and Joe Biden going head to head, it was a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that will be repeated, but it might. We might have a repeat match of Trump-Biden. It's very possible. Um, so I think it would be more optimal if we had younger presidents because of the energy factor that it takes to be president. However, you can delegate. Um, Reagan did a marvelous job, of, of even after he was shot, of getting rid of Alexander Haig and replacing him with George Shultz and finding a, a team with Mike Deaver and Baker and the rest that uh, function well. 
And, you know, the, the same with Dwight Eisenhower, who was um, old as president, and he brought a staff around him that was quite effective. So Biden or Trump, if they're willing to let others, you know, do a lot of the work, um, can be kind of above the fray. I noticed with Biden, there, I don't think he's like Ronald Reagan. However, the one thing I have noticed at Biden's style as president, he's like a Macy's Day afloat. He's kind of floating above the parade. Reagan did that a lot, too, meaning just kind of there's all this noise and clamor and Biden's just floating kind of on top of it all. Um, that is probably a smart way for him to govern if he can avoid the gaffes. You don't need to do too many interviews. Don't say something off the cuff. Uh, keep to the teleprompter, delegate a lot, and then be low-keyed and generous and be able to show a kind of public grief with these shootings or climate disasters that we might have. Uh, he might have a formula of being the right person for the right time. Uh, character matters um, and and the disposition so, you know, Gerald Ford was the right person after Nixon. He proved tone, uh, in a sense of tone and tenor. Uh, and you might see that. In fact, Ford's memoir is called A Time to Heal. Jimmy Carter's was Keeping Faith. Biden is coming after the tumultuous Trump years. And it very may be people will see him as, a, as somebody who healed the country. Reagan used to also say, stay above 50 percent in the polls. Uh, and if Biden could uh, navigate his first year at 60 percent approval rating, he'll be able to be a very strong president. Now, as a historian and somebody who's interviewed all these presidents, have you made an attempt yet to interview Joe Biden as president? And if you haven't and you do, what angle would you take? Well, I haven't because I'm so busy right now writing a book. And um, but I have had a long talk with Kamala Harris already, um, and that was interesting. Uh, I was interested in her because of historic role as the first woman vice president. And one of the things I do, Brian, as a historian, is I look back and say, who in history is going to be remembered? Walter Mondale died recently, and not, it didn't get the amount of attention. People aren't talking about Mondale's career, but he was vice president and an important senator forever. Um, where Kamala Harris, being the first woman to actually achieve a vice presidency, is going to be talked about forever. She's going to be a key person studied in women's history classes like Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Hillary Clinton or Harriet Tubman or Jane Addams or Susan B. Anthony. And so right now, Kamala Harris interests me somewhat more than than Biden. It's sort of like Robert Frost, the road less, you know, you're at the fort, everybody's hitting on Biden, where actually Kamala Harris is a very interesting story to me. What did you learn from talking to her? Um, you know, she's got, a, uh, as we all know, she's got a great personality and she's funny. And I'm always amazed at the t interactions, how just genuinely she laughs at life. That's going to um, serve her well. It has served her well. Um, I think she's unusual vice president in her first 100 days. Because of COVID, she hasn't traveled many places. And so she's been every single day in the room with Biden. There really is kind of a, almost a co-presidency going on between Biden and Harris. Co-presidency is too heavy, but there, in the history of presidents and vice presidents, it's, it's looking to shape up to be one of the, the closest. And part of that is age factor with Biden. He ha she has to start training. Uh, if she, uh, God forbid, something happened to Biden, she'd have to step up. And I've, I've noticed she's being very careful to try to carve out what her role is, uh, avoiding too much media limelight while she's starting to get her ducks in a row. When you talk to somebody like her on the phone, what are the rules? None. I had none with her. I, 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 I probably a younger me would have been looking to write an article, get on, hop on the train. I've, you know, had a, a, an exclusive, you know, hour, but I'm not interested in exclusives. Uh, you know, um, it, it's more about thinking long term. Um, down the line, building a kind of credibility that uh, I might down the line write a book about this era and I would need to interview her. And, and so, um, you know, 
beyond talking to you about it, I haven't mentioned it to a single soul. Uh, it was just, you know, would I like to do that with Biden? Sure. But, you know, it's a uh, right now it's busy. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's shots and arms. He's got his, you know, his hands filled. What's the point of trying to bust into his calendar uh, unless I were going to write a profile of him for a magazine? Can you explain the relationship of Hunter Biden to his father? We know that the conservatives have been highly critical of the mainstream media for not covering Hunter Biden like they did the Trump family. And then can you explain why Hunter Biden would publish a book in the middle of all this and admit all the things that he did in that book about his drug use? You know, I think... Unlike a lot of people with substance abuse issues, which Hunter Biden clearly had, um, and is sometimes they're angry at their their parents. That wasn't Hunter Biden's case. In fact, he's over loves his father. Uh, they're really really tight, and um, and his he has zero animosity towards dad. Um, so what we're dealing with is somebody who's a deep substance abuser, and when that happens. I mean, it's a disease and it takes over your life. And we can see that whether it was crack cocaine or alcohol, uh, you know, midnight rambling of all kind, uh, Hunter Biden had a problem, a serious problem. Um, and he's out in California trying to clean up, uh, trying to get, as somebody does, uh, the, you know, treatment to get healed, to get better. And the book. I don't know why he, you know, why he decided to write that with the timing uh, right after in the first 100 days, get it out. My guess, and it's only a guess, would be two things, uh, advance money for the book, um, and B, he had been in his mind, you know, um, demonized by the right uh, during the campaign, and he stayed quiet and basically went underground, so much so that Trump would at stump speeches, where's Hunter, you know? And so he decided once it was safe to pop up, meaning his dad's in the White House, I'm gonna tell my story now. Uh, he obviously was thinking about the book during 2020 and may have kept him busy, so he didn't tr make public appearances during the campaign. Uh, and he, he quite effectively muzzled himself in 2020 and, and stayed out of the glare when he was probably the, one of the most sought after interviews in the world. And so I, the book kind of came, it got some attention, it made the bestseller list, but uh, I don't think it's, uh, I think it was more for him cathartic than it was necessary to do. How important are stories <clears throat> and spotlights on the children of presidents? Oh, it can, it's, you know, there's a, there was a great Washington Post story I read recently um, much as I know about presidents, they were laundry listing all the problems different pre Andrew Jackson had with his um, son and on and on um, with different issues of alcohol or suicide. Uh, families aren't perfect. Um, just because somebody's a president doesn't mean there's not dysfunction swirling about them with a sibling um, or, with a, or with a child or with a, you know, a cousin or, or who knows what. Um, and so they the, you know, look at problems that the Kennedy family had with um, some of the Bobby Kennedy's kids had drug and alcohol problems and they come forward and they decide at some point, once you get clean, to share your experience, hoping you can convince others to get rehab. And that's the Betty Ford tradition, right? I mean, the Betty, you go, Betty Ford's clinics are famous for substance abuse and saying, admit it, um, come public and get help, and you can still have a life. And that's happened to a lot of children of presidents. Douglas Brinkley is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching Douglas Brinkley in the video library at cspan.org.